today we're gonna this is the third ser- the third sermon, and Casey's been inviting us to kind of a a mindset of following Jesus, of entering people's worlds, of being attuned to people's feelings and needs, and asking questions, entering their world, being interested in what's going on in their lives. And so as you get involved in the lives of others, you're going to encounter um, issues, problems, struggles. And so today what we're going to focus on is the costliness of love. Casey was very right, I think, to invite us to prepare. We need to make room to be ready to be hospitable, to invite people into our lives. Um, And that takes preparation. And so today we're going to be thinking about the cost and where we find the power and the motivation to love people wherever they are when they cross our path. And so just to kind of rethink what it's like to build relationships with people, to take initiative. Any of you heard of the Sicilian comedian Sebastian Maniscotti or something, I said his name wrong. Just look up on YouTube, Sicilian Comedian, and there a playlist will come up, and the very first one has him talking about an experience in his life. He's like, the other day, my doorbell rang. He's like, and you know, your doorbell ringing today is different than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, your doorbell rang, everybody was happy. It's called company. And right away you can see where he's going that that's not the way it is anymore you know back in the day your whole family sprung up and greeted them and hours would go by he said your mom has this intimates that she told hey you better pray to god that we get company this is not for you this is for company and so when the company would come everyone would get to cut the cake and it was a great experience he's like now somebody rings your doorbell you're like what the Everybody's crawling across the floor, mom, army crawl, get the sword, you know, like complete suspicion. What is going on? Who could possibly be knocking on my door? They got to be selling me something. And so we're in a radically different world. And just for some of us, building relationships even with our neighbors, just greeting them and uh, taking initiative to get to know them may feel really scary. And we might not know what kind of, you know, things are going to happen. And so if that's, if you're like me in that respect, this message is going to really encourage you. We're going to look at the problem of, of costly relationships, of getting involved in others' lives. And so you'll see the, sec- the name of this message is the magnitude of mercy. Magnitude means greatness to a great extent. And so I don't know what you think about when you think about powerful and big, but I think about the Avengers. Anyone ready for Avengers Endgame to come out? All right. Well, I saw this article in the Wall Street Journal, and they said that pre-sale tickets just came out, and they've already sold just in the first few hours of this pre-sale happening. The movie's not even out yet. More tickets made more money than they did for the biggest opener of a movie here in the United States. Anyone want to guess what that was? Star Wars. Outsold Star Wars opening weekend in just the first few hours. It literally jammed up all the servers, and they had to close it down for a little bit. And any of you who have not seen the last Avengers movie, Infinity War, the last paragraph of this article says, the pent-up demand for Avengers Endgame is driven in part by the ending of Infinity War, which closed with half the Marvel heroes disintegrating into dust. Many fans expect Endgame to offer resolution to that cliffhanger. And that was my guess, and then I had it confirmed by the Wall Street Journal, so you know it must be true, that when a movie has a really tragic ending and people disintegrate, I mean, that's a pretty big deal, and then those people are separated from each other, there's alienation, you got to know how the story turns out. And I'm here to tell you today as we get ready to dive into the Good Samaritan parable of Jesus that our lives demand a resolution, do they not? We've been through some serious disintegration, you know? Your insides just falling apart, coming apart at the seams. Our, your relationships coming apart at the seams. And it looks so dark and it's so bleak. It demands a resolution. 
It's the ultimate cliffhanger. Have you been there? And so we're going to look at how the gospel invades dark spaces and how love itself will overcome all of these pictures of brokenness. And so we're going to see that if we're going to go into people's lives, if we're going to become a culture of people of hospitality, always ready and eager and willing to meet people where they are, to meet needs, that's what mercy means. What does mercy mean? Just my last quote for the day, by the way. Any of you who know me, this is a miracle. Mercy. Mercy is one of God's primary characteristics. It's one of the things about God that keeps me going. If you're really fatigued, if you're really tired, if you're really weary, if you're really worn out, God's mercy is that rock that you can stand on when you have nothing left. Tim Keller says about God's mercy, Greek word elios, is that aspect of his nature which moves him to relieve suffering and misery. Mercy is the impulse that makes us sensitive to hurts and lacks in others and makes us desire to alleviate them. These hurts or lacks are what we call needs. So as we're moving forward, we're going to get a, a powerful picture of mercy in action, and that's going to invite us to experience that powerful love and mercy that alleviates suffering so that we can be vehicles of that mercy to others. So that when we see others, no matter what we're going through, we can be moved with powerful compassion. It's one of the things that makes us human, is it not? And yet life can just have such a sustained, grinding, just relentless suffering that uh, we can lose some of that humanity and just become numb to each other. And so we're going to see how the gospel addresses that. And here's the main idea that I want you to walk away with when the message is over. I hope this is the thing that the Lord shows you as he showed me, because when we look at this picture of what is required for us to be agents of God's heavenly kingdom on earth, to begin to bring substantial healing and restoration to the broken places in this world, we're going to need to experience love's power. And so wherever you are this morning, whatever you're going through, whatever you brought in here, whether you're just on cloud nine or you're below the worst you've ever, you've ever been, God's love is powerful enough to meet you where you are today. And I'm praying that you experience that power before we go. And so as we dive into our passage, some of you, if you have Bibles, you can pull them out to Luke 10, or you can follow along behind me. We want to ask, how powerful is love? Because there are some serious barriers between us and relationships with people we don't know, and even relationships with people that we do know. Serious barriers. When we really try to love people, all kinds of things stop us. How powerful is love? Let's pray, and we're going to start reading. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, your word, the unfolding of your word brings light. I pray that in my weakness, your power would be made perfect. I pray that as we think about your word together, that you would open our eyes to see Jesus, that his compassion, his love, would be so powerful that it begins that work of healing and renewal and restoration that enables us to reach out past our own suffering to show mercy and love to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So how powerful is love? First thing we're going to see, Luke 10, 25, and 26. Love disarms opposition. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Put him to the test. So Jesus is moving. He's doing his ministry. He's healing people. He's bringing life. And again and again and again, we're told that Jesus experienced deep compassion when he saw people in any state of misery, whether it's feeding 5,000 because they're hungry and they haven't eaten for days, or it's bringing life to the dead or sight to the blind, whatever it is. He's moved with compassion. And then somebody comes who has an agenda, not to really ask a sincere question, but to discredit Jesus, to make him look stupid in front of everybody else so that this lawyer can feel superior and have this pesty Jesus out of the way. So the motive for the question, the question is great. 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? But the motive is sinister. He wants to discredit Jesus. How does Jesus respond? Because what you need to know about Jesus is that he's a master teacher. And like Casey has been telling us again and again, asked 25 different questions in the four Gospels, 21 of those responses were Jesus asking a question. It's a mark of master teachers. And so he's going to do the same thing here. He's going to meet this person. He's an expert in the law. This would be like a scholar, a Bible scholar, a professor at a prestigious university. He's going to take something that this scholar is into and use that to find common ground. And then out of a motivation not of malice or desire to humiliate, he's going to entrap. He's going to turn the tables. He's going to entrap this Bible scholar for the purpose of winning him to be his brother. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So see, Casey's been inviting us to this. Meet people, find common ground, enter their world, ask questions. So he starts with something this guy is an expert in, the law. What is written in it? How do you read it? Real quick illustration from my own life of love disarming opposition. I'm in a seminary class right now. Anybody getting ready for finals, writing huge papers? You're exhausted. Well, it's about the character of God. And so I'm learning all these big words about God. God's a satiety. He's, he's from himself. He's self-existent. When he introduced himself to Moses and the people of Israel, Moses is like, I have a stutter. I'm 80-something years old. I'm going to go to the most powerful king in the world and say, let Israel go his entire free labor force? No, I can't do that. Who do I say has sent me? And he said, tell them, I am has sent you. What? I am? The universe, everything that exists, exists because the spiritual being, Yahweh, spoke it effortlessly into existence. That's God's aseity. So anyways, all these big words, but there's this one professor that I had to read a really long, tedious book by, and he, he annoyed the hehe out of me, because he was basically saying that God doesn't have emotions, because he's perfect and limitless and omniscient, he knows everything, and emotions involve something happening to you passively, and that's an imperfection, and God has all perfections, so there's no emotions, and I'm like, oh, you're arousing a lot of emotions in me, and so... I have to write this 15-page paper, and I emailed him because he's in a, a book that's coming out in four months writing about my subject, that God doesn't have emotions. And I'm annoyed at this guy because his book annoyed me, but I, I'm nice. And he sends me a response, and he lets me read his chapter four months before the book comes out, and he signs it, Yours in Christ. And his loving response to me took me from my being annoyed to, wow, this guy's cool, man. And now, I want to be like that. When I'm annoyed with somebody, I want to be able to have so much love in my heart that I can disagree with them charitably. And I can try to really care about winning them over as my friend. So that's what Jesus is doing here. He's going to entrap him, but he's not trying to do it to humiliate. Look what we find, Luke 10, 27 and 28. He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now before we look at what Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your being. You want to fulfill the law? That mind that God's given you, that heart that he's given you, your passions, your all of your being and all of your strength, all of your physical energy, all that you have, if you focus on loving your creator, the one who's given you everything, that will help you fulfill the law. That's pretty amazing. And so what I think is suggested here is that if we have eyes to see, love is something we can all agree on, is virtuous. It's amazing. Well, if you, the more that you understand God and who he is and what he's going to do in, in the world, the more that you'll realize that you'll never be able to love him adequately to who he is. His goodness is infinite. It's greater than the universe. And so even with all of your being, we'll never be able to love him adequately to who he is. And some of you who know the Bible know that he's going to give you his capacity to love forever. 
And so transcendent means that it, it surpasses all bounds. It's limitless. It's borderless. And so the invitation to love God is what empowers us to love people. And so this is simple. We can get this, right? He, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. That's a command. Anybody not like being told what to do? Let's look at what happens next. The drama is building. Luke 10, 29 through 30. But he, the religious expert, the law expert, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, then who is my neighbor? Desiring to justify himself. What does that mean? We don't use that word very much. Um, Tim Keller uses a couple of examples of what this means. It means to be right with. And so just two different senses of not being right with someone. If you have a checkbook and you write checks and your last eight of ten checks bounced and you go and you try to write another check and the person who you're writing it to knows about these previous eight out of ten bounce checks, you're not justified with them. You don't have this, this credit with them that you need to do what you're trying to do. You're not right. You need to justify yourself. Why should I trust you and give you this thing that you're paying me for? But here's an even more powerful example of justify, of being not right with someone. Picture that you're invited to this really amazing party with tons of people that you really admire and look up to. And it's a, you're told, um, a costume party. And so you show up with a hairy chest and a manator body. And, uh, and you're excited, you know, to be ridiculous and have fun and meet these people you really can't wait to meet. And you get there and you, they open the door and you see it's a black tie affair. Everybody's an elegant, nice garb. You stick out like a sore thumb, a hairy manator. Complete humiliation. You are not right with this crowd. You're not justified. And then the, the host of the party, who everybody wishes that they could know, comes to you and says, hey, whatever, you're cool. Come with me. I got you. And they come up to the VIP. And, and then everybody's cool with you because you're cool with the host, and they wish they could be cool with the host. And so desiring to justify yourself means that there's this sense that you don't feel acceptable. And so what do you look to to justify yourself? What do you look to to try to feel right? Because you know you're not right. You're afraid. You don't like who you are behind closed doors. You don't accept yourself. And you're also afraid that anyone else who knows you will reject you too. So what do you look to? Is it your job? Is it your body? Is it your looks? Is it your status? All of those things are things that we look to to justify us, to give us self-worth. And when Jesus says, all right, love God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself, go and do likewise, this guy lost face because he's a religious expert and he just was shown in front of all these people that he was hoping he would be you know, victorious over. I can't do that. You got to give me something more reachable, Jesus. I got to justify myself. I got to prove my worth. I think all of us can relate to that. There's this really strong defensiveness in us. I got to justify myself. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. So Jerusalem is 3,500 feet above sea level. Jer Jericho is east north and east from Jerusalem, and yet it's a thousand feet below sea level. So when you're leaving Jerusalem, you go down. And this road from Jerusalem to uh, Jericho was known, notorious, for being a dangerous road because it was full of crags and, and there would be robbers, and, you, and it was notorious. It was called the Bloody Road because literally people were victims of crime there constantly. So this would be like going down a really dark ghetto area in a city without anyone with you. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So right away, this situation of who is my neighbor? What does a person have to do to qualify for me to meet their needs? Mercy is felt needs, meeting those needs. What do they have to do? Jesus doesn't answer that question. He focuses, what we're seeing here, on 
being a neighbor. There are no limits to who you should love and impoverish yourself to meet their needs. You should be ready and willing to disadvantage yourself to advantage others anytime. That's pretty radical. This is a scary thing. And so here's a picture of this. My son is three years old. We just celebrated his, per his uh, third birthday last week. And um, there's a thing in our routine every day that I dread. It's called bath time. Because when we do bath time and it's time to wash his hair, it's a meltdown because he can't seem to get through that process of cleaning his hair without getting it in his eyes and freaking out and having a Mach 3 meltdown. And so last night, it's just me because Joy's out, and I'm giving him a bath, and I'm like, all right, we're doing a shower. All right, you know, how do you want to do this? I'm giving him options. Let's problem solve. And he's like, I'm not going to do it. I'm scared. And I'm like, but you just keep your eyes closed, and I'll help you, and we'll just get it all done really fast. It'll be over in a second. And he's like, I could not convince him. He's like, no, I won't do it. And I'm like, oh, impasse. What do I do? And so I picked him up. And I was like, let's try this. Daddy's got you. Turn around and like slowly take the water and put it on his head and, and, and get it off. And then I'm like, see, that wasn't so bad. And I was like, boom, this is a picture of how God helps us to do things that we're scared to do. Because the first obstacle we're going to encounter when we start to be intentional about loving people, entering their, their world, and being ready to show compassion and mercy is fear. What if they reject me? What if they don't want help? What if, what if, what if, what if? You feel me? And so here's how you cope with that. If you understand God as Jesus, God in the flesh with you, he'll guide you through everything. And sometimes he'll completely remove the fear of what he's calling you to do. And then other times he won't. Anyone familiar with this? But I want to encourage you, when you're the most weak, his love is strong enough to quiet your fear and to help you get through it. And so wherever love takes you, seek your rest in him. Love will quiet your fear. So this guy is beaten and left half dead, 31 and 32. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So these are two people who are leaving Jerusalem, going back to their home. They've just come from valid religious duties, ceremonies, external religious displays. And they see a person in this alley, beaten and left for dead, groaning. And instead of being awakened to compassion and stirred with motivation to alleviate his suffering, you see complete apathy walk through on the other side. I can't get involved. I'll be ceremonially unclean. There could be a marauding band right around the corner, and I could die. So self-interest, schedule, convenience, apathy, disinterest, lack of love, just keep going. And unfortunately, Jesus, the main crowd that he clashed with the most was religious people. Some of us are religious people. We have a lot of spiritual stuff in our life, a lot of external things that we do, but when we see real people with real needs, complete apathy, no concern. This is exposing our lovelessness. Let's keep going. Luke 10, 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, this is not what you were expecting. If you were a first century Jew, compassion, the hero, the protagonist of this story that Jesus is telling, is a Samaritan. Nobody was more hated by a Jew than a Samaritan. These were, they were related. They had a, there had been, you know, 12 tribes in Israel, and then um, there was a succession of kings who weren't godly. The, the kingdom split 10 tribes to the north. That became Samaria was their, uh, their main city where they worshipped. And as they split from the two southern tribes, when both of God's peoples got taken away into captivity, Assyria and Babylon, Samaria, they got intermarried with all these other peoples. So they were no longer ethnically pure. And they no longer worshipped, were willing to worship in Jerusalem, 
they, they created their own place to worship. And so they became assimilated into other cultures. And they were radically different than the Jews. And so when the Jews were really angry at Jesus in John 8, the worst thing they could think of to call him was a Samaritan. They're like, aren't we not right that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Like, it was the worst thing. And so this hero, this person who risked his life to in, in, involve himself in this hurting man's situation is someone who has no obligation to do so. They're sworn enemies. And so remember what Jesus is teaching us here, not who qualifies for me to expend myself for, but what does it mean to be a neighbor? And he's saying there's no limits. You see humanity in need, and you are here to move with my love and compassion and mercy and meet that need. And so this guy could have, in his resentment, said, no, man, this is my enemy. I'm not, I'm not rolling with that. He got his. He got what he deserved. Follow me? Any of you who are in the 12-step programs, you know that the first thing that we need to eliminate before we can start to work on ourselves and heal is what? Resentment. Because as long as you're poisoned with all of this anger, you're not examining it towards others, you can't start to heal. You can't start to change. And so one of the things they'll have you do, those of you who haven't done 12-step programs, is identify why these resentments, what this person did, how they affected you. Did they affect your relationships? Did they affect your job security? Did they affect your self-esteem? What did they rob from you that makes you so angry at them? This Samaritan had every reason in the world to despise this guy and leave him there to die. But he was moved with compassion. Love overcomes resentment. As long as you're poisoned by resentment, your humanity is shriveling, and you will distance yourself further and further from those closest to you and miss out on what God wants to do and give you freedom. Luke 10, 34 through 35, love reverses stinginess. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii. That's uh, two days' wages. That's enough for two months of staying in this inn. And gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He completely demolishes his schedule, abandons that. He takes care of his wounds, both to promote healing and to stave off infection. He puts him on his own animal, takes him, transportation, to a place where he can start to mend, looks out for him over the night to make sure he doesn't die, and then pays a hefty subsidy so that the guy can get what he needs. And then he says he's coming back. This is comprehensive care. This is holistic care. This is what are your needs? Let me help meet your needs. This is what Jesus is saying it is. It means to love your neighbor as yourself, to meet your neighbor's needs with all the zeal and energy and excitement that you meet your own. Anybody starting to feel kind of spiritually bankrupt here? I don't love like this. Let's keep going. Luke 10, 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The law expert said, the one who showed him mercy. See, he couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan because of that, that prejudice in his heart. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. It was a trap. Love sprang a trap. Now, this is the end of our passage, so what do we learn? Let's stop back and review, and we'll make some application and pray. Why did Jesus tell him this parable? Because he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And John, I come to this church every Sunday, and you talk about the gospel, the good news, that what we can't do, love God and love others, Jesus did for us. He lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserve to die. He rose on the third day, overcoming sin and death for us. He gives us eternal life as a gift. Why are you telling us now we need to love God perfectly and love our neighbor as ourselves? That's incongruent. Those two things are incompatible. You're conflicting yourself. 
doesn't make sense. You're contradicting yourself. No. Jesus is saying, let me show you what it means to be human. It's to be pervaded with love. And once I show you what's required to really love me and others in proportion to our worth, it will beggar your imagination. It will completely humble you into the dust because you'll realize, I've never loved like this and I can never love like this. That's the point. That's the reason why Jesus came. He's not telling you, hey, here's how you save yourself. He's saying you can't save yourself. So rather than just telling you that, let me illustrate the dimensions of love. Let me show you the magnitude of love so that it makes you feel bankrupt. Because what we cannot do when we see the law, we realize, like, we thought we were awesome. And then somebody starts to talk about what it looks like to be fully human and to glorify God, and we're like, I suck. I'm, I'm lost. This, that train left forever ago. I'm, I'm hopeless. But the gospel teaches you to fear. It shows, it exposes your inadequacy so that it can lead you to who? Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law for you, and even though he was worthy of all honor, subjected himself to the greatest poverty. He impoverished himself for you so that you by his poverty could be made rich. Jesus is the ultimate good Samaritan. He left heaven to come on a rescue mission for you and me. And we're his sworn enemy. You may not feel like God's sworn enemy, but every time you look to ultimate happiness in self and the world instead of God, you're cheating on your ultimate spouse. You're giving the love and devotion and affection and allegiance to a created thing that you should give to him supremely. And so we're his sworn enemies. And yet rather than dismissing us and saying, nah, you dug your grave, lie in it, he leaves everything, all the glories of heaven, to be born into poverty from his birth all the way to his 30s. And here he is going around and starting to show, hey, this is what the kingdom of God is going to do. God is going to come in and he's going to make everything sad come untrue. He's going to start to heal and restore lives and relationships and one day the whole world. And he's being opposed at every point. And yet he impoverishes himself. The one with all power was silent when they were trying him. Pilate and Herod and all of his accusers. He was abandoned and forsaken and got silence from heaven so that when you're feeling forsaken, when you're feeling beat up by life, when you're feeling like, my life is so broken, everything is so hard, there's no way God could love me because if he loved me, he would not allow me to go through these things. You're supposed to look to Jesus and see, wow, I can, life can be really hard, but I can never doubt God's love for me. Because while I was his enemy, he gave me his best. While I was his enemy, he impoverished himself. While I was his enemy, he didn't just risk his life, he gave his life. He exchanged places with me so that I could be made rich. And so this leads us to the gospel. This is what I want you to see as I invite the uh, worship team to come back out to just play quietly as we, we uh, end the service. When you hear about this invitation to reveal God's love and mercy to those around you, when you start to follow him in the way of hospitality and you start to invite people into your life, some of you may feel like, how can I do that? You don't understand. I'm already in over my head. My house is a mess. I can't let anybody in there. There's too many barriers, too many obstacles, too many challenges, and I'm so weak. I have nothing to give. Well, I want to encourage you that when you have nothing to give, you have Jesus. And when you see Jesus loving you through those things, being affected by your misery and desiring to alleviate it, and one day he's going to do that perfectly, you experiencing the Holy Spirit through Jesus, through his love now in your brokenness, can enable you to move into others' lives, to care about them to listen to them. Because here's the thing. We have the best news in the universe. God saves. 
he rescues and restores. We're broken and disfigured and ugly and impoverished, and he makes us beautiful and wealthy in his love. And we have the hope of a restored universe where there's nothing sad anymore. And in the meantime, you can be an agent of that healing and restoration. And it starts not by doing, it starts not by working yourself up to go try harder. It starts by admitting, I can't do this. I'm spiritually bankrupt. You did it for me. I surrender. Have you done that? And if you have done that, this is how you continue. Anyone feel like you can't continue? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this reminder of your mercy that when you see misery, even though you're infinite in being, even though you don't need us, you love us. And when we hurt, you hurt. And you don't just sympathize with our suffering. You do something about it. You've done something about it. And even right now, God, you can enter in to whatever space we find ourselves and comfort us. Lord, I pray that people who feel so disquieted, so alone, so alienated, so isolated, so apart from others, that you would meet them right now. That they would fall into your arms. That they would let you carry them and start to put them back together. In this moment where no one else is looking or nothing else is happening, just surrender yourself to Jesus' love. Invite him to mend you, to hold you, to comfort you, to encourage you. And then invite him to empower you to keep coming to him until he wipes every tear from your eye. And Jesus, would you fill us with your love and compassion for others so that regardless of what they've done to us or haven't done to us, that we wouldn't care. We would see them as a human being, infinitely valuable and worthy of your love, our love. Help us to meet needs because you've met ours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so as you guys go, as you're dismissed today, receive this benediction. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a big word that just means a blessing from someone who's sharing God's word with you. In Jesus' name, may you experience comfort in your discomfort. And in Jesus' name, may you feel beckoned to his arms. In Jesus' name, may you feel his love and become an agent of that love to everyone around you. Go in peace. Enjoy your weekend.